it on. Two thirds a person. Rapings and beatings and suffering and worsens. Black human packages tied up in strings. Black rage can come from all these kinds of things. Black rage is founded on blatant denial. Squeeze economics, subsistence survival. Deafening silence and social control. Just found in all wounds in the soul. When the dogs bite, when the bees sing, when I'm feeling sad, I simply remember all these kinds of things, and then I don't fear so bad. Black rage is founded, fed us self-hatred, lies and abuse, while we waited and waited, spiritual treason, this grid and its cages, black rage is founded on these kinds of things. Tell me how this website came about, how this project came about. Right, so we're all in a class um, titled The Black Body Intercepting Intimacies. And um, for our final project, we had an option of either writing a paper based off of all of what we've learned this semester, or we could do an intervention. And given the campus climate, uh, Robin came up with a great idea for an intervention, and she said, "Why don't we just Why don't we make a website addressing?" Or actually, she said, "Why don't we do a counter campaign? Yeah, counter campaign to uh, or better than that, just because as a group collectively, we saw that it had a lot of different." Laws and that it was not educational and that it, it was not um, addressing the needs of the campus in the way that it should have been given the previous protests and all of what students of color go through on this campus and, and all of what allies and potential allies do not know about the struggles. Um, and the reason I kind of had the idea for the campaign is just kind of the rollout of the campaign is something that kind of disturbed me. It's like we're better than that. It wasn't really addressing, you know, the fact that like racism is like a structural thing. It was also like we're going to focus on our campus, but we're not going to focus about the racial climate and temperature in the community. Um, and when people leave here after four years, you know, they're going to have to combat that and kind of address that in their lives outside of it. So I thought that they really needed to take a broader approach in the campaign in general. Yeah, and specifically focusing on structural racism rather than interpersonal racism was something that was really important to us because I felt like, you know, it's, it's very easy uh, to say, oh, you know, don't, you know, say a bad word to somebody else or, or you know, don't uh, be racist in your face-to-face -face conversations, you know, that, that that's the easy part. The difficult part is recognizing um, you know, the role that a lot of us play in upholding certain institutions and structures, including the ones that exist at the University of Rochester. What do you want, what do you want the current community at large to take away from it? What do you want students to take away from it? So personally, I don't think that this is a website for students of color or students that have been victims of um, the racism and the structural racism. Like being born into the skin that I'm in, I'm automatically out of like having to necessarily navigate this website. Um, that's not my burden, but I think that it's for people that um, are having a hard time understanding that it is a larger structure, and um, it's for people that might even deny that racism exists, that racism on this campus is not a problem. Um, but that's my take on it. Um, I think when we were doing it, especially when we were writing things, we wanted to kind of make it very accessible to like, all people, especially because we've been taking classes and having these conversations for a while now. Uh, but it's for people on this campus who maybe like saw the campaign and were like, eh, something seems wrong about that, or who are just like, I'm not racist, so the burden is not me, like it's not my responsibility. Um, and it's just to kind of teach them about the larger structures, and even if they're not doing those interpersonal actions like Miles was talking about, um, how it still affects the lives of students and community people of color. Also, I think part of our aim was to address different misconceptions mm -hmm. um, about like certain buzzwords that the media uses. One, one uh, part of the website that I focused on writing was the myth of black on black crime. And I'm not gonna explain it all now because it's a little complicated. You can go to the website if you want. <laughs> yeah, try, trying to address some of, some of the things that were 
kind of uh, saturated with in, in the media and address why, you know, some of these things that we take for granted as, as normalized things are inherently racist. I also want to backpedal a little bit. So I initially said that this website is not for people like me, but I've had the opportunity to gain the education about like the history of housing in America and just different um, aspects whereby black people have really been given the short end of the stick, more than the short end of the end of the stick. But um, I think that we all did a really good job. We're also missing a group member, um, Shakti, but we all did a really good job of um, putting in facts and historical facts to um, paint the broader picture. With that said, we paired, you know, providing a historical context for understanding all of this with a lived experiences yeah. page. Um, and then, do either of you want to talk about it a bit more? Okay. Um, so, uh, what we did, we, we just went around and uh, we asked different people to give us a portrait and um, have an interview with them. And we, a we asked questions uh, like, probably have to redo this, this section. If you want us to start over now? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So with the lived experiences section of the website, we really wanted to make sure that we got personal narratives to pair with the historical uh, context that, that we're providing. Um, because, you know, a lot of people really need uh, a face to, to the name and, and um, a face to the movement to really be able to internalize and understand like, oh, this isn't something that's just existing elsewhere, like people I know, my friends are, are having these experiences. So we went around, took some portraits of people and asked them to talk about their experiences with structural racism or with uh, some white folks, we asked them to talk about their experiences coming to terms with uh, learning about structural racism and, and, and learning that they have a role to play in, in currently upholding and trying to you know, destroy those structures. And if there's anyone out there that <clears throat> wants to share their story and feels like um, it's important to get it out there and it wouldn't be tiring to share that story, we welcome more submissions. I'm just wondering, can you give me a, like a, and you do this on the site too, which is helpful, just a brief timeline of like events leading up to like this project and, and the demands and what point you're, where you're at now, I guess. Right, so personally, I, uh, during our time on this campus, during our four years, I think that it started with the Confederate flag incident in, um, I want to say, October of 2015, or 2014, and then um, it kind of spiraled. Then a year later, we see Ferguson happening, and students wanting to show solidarity and um, kind of look at our own campus and see what we could do to improve, um, and then flash forward to this year, um, November, students uh, saw what was happening. Oh, sorry, actually Yik Yak happened uh, last spring. Uh, students in DLH, they were able to renew their housing contract and um, they had a lot of racist backlash, um, threats against their body, threats against their house, uh, threats against so many different things and it, it really like revealed that there are different individuals on this campus that hold very racist beliefs. Um, and then the way the administration dealt with it showed that there are structural issues as well. Um, and then flash forward to this year, Mizzou was happening and they were dealing with racism on their campus. People were speaking up and out and protesting. And students on our campus were like, we are Mizzou as well. We've, we've dealt with so many different things. And so they presented a list of demands. And um, I think that's what was like the culminating event, you know. Um, I know that some of the demands, they wanted more faculty of color. Uh, they wanted to uh, introduce a, um, a program, whether it be like through orientation or like as part of the, the curriculum to have diversity training. Um, they wanted to... VLH is a permanent, yeah. you know, structure. That, as a safe space on campus. That will, you know, always be there for students of color and not have to be renewed on a three-year basis or so. They wanted a separate office for OMSA because right now it's currently in the same space as the Center for Study Abroad and there's not a lot of resources yet. We see the university building so many different buildings but they can't give us that space. Um, a, a plethora of things, honestly. The big one was banning Yak. Banning, that yeah. That was like the yeah. most controversial one. 
they, the first response was Seligman issuing that he wanted to create a commission on race, but in creating that commission we only saw um, very little representation of students, one, it was mostly administrators, and then I think out of the four students, there were only two students of color, one of them who had been deeply involved in um, the protests and having experienced living in DLH and receiving threats. Um, and so voices were diminished in that capacity, and then when they released the interim report, um, he addressed some things, but like half-heartedly, in my opinion. Um, I can, I have an email where I like literally went through all of it, I can... No, 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 that's fine. I think the big issue is that what we keep hearing from the administration is, oh, there'll be more, like, we're working on it, like, don't worry. Um, and I think a lot of the student frustration, especially being seniors, is we've been seeing this kind of bubble for the last four years, um, and we're kind of tired. Especially, like Miles was saying beforehand, like, you know, like, we created this website in about two weeks, um, so we know that you can work faster. In terms. Right. Right. What do they do? What's their solution to this problem? That's a really good question. What is their solution? Um, I I was able to speak with some of the um, administrators on the, on the commission, and they what they said to me was it's going to be like a slow and steady climb. Some of them were a little bit more jaded, and they, they believed that this was just a band-aid um, to be put on until people like us graduate, and then other people have to pick it up, start anew, and like, you know, start from scratch. So there's been mixed uh, reviews, but I think that because they also have to deal with so many other job responsibilities, um, it might just get pushed to the wayside and put back on students and other faculty of color to continue to address these issues. When did the, when did the university roll out its uh, We're Better Than That campaign? Was that, that was just recently, correct? Yeah, pretty recent. They had their first like public event two weeks ago maybe, and before that they were just giving away t-shirts and pins at um, the like, basketball, basketball games. Basketball games, yeah. Students don't really attend. They yeah. also... As of two or three days ago, the last time I checked their website, the bulk of their content is photos of students and faculty and staff wearing We're Better Than That shirts and links to local news stations covering the We're Better Than That movement. They uh, also had students submit videos um, to go with the campaign. Again, putting the onus on the students to like educate their peers and like try and get that out there instead of putting like professional university resources towards combating things. Like they could have even done a mixture of the two to get student perspective and um, just more resources. What kind of reaction are you expecting from the administration? I mean, I think we're all a little bit nervous. Um, okay. Like we do, we are actively soliciting feedback, and we do want feedback from students and administrators about the effectiveness of this. Um, but we did. I'm just thinking about um, last Friday. We had Sean King, who's the first yes. speaker, um, and he came and gave an amazing speech. Um, we have it on the website, and it got sent out to all the students afterwards, um, talking about how we're not always kind of getting better at how we treat other people, um, but also how people in power don't always want to admit that, um, and it's hard for them to do that, and he brought up some points. He was saying that the administration should have been yik yak, um, and there was some pushback at that from the administrators because even though it was a diversity conference, um, it was predominantly like administrators and staff and other community members, there wasn't a ton of students there. Yeah, with that said, we all know good administrators in OMSA. I know Bethel Lavar is the Dean of Diversity, she's great. And I I anticipate that they'll be really happy with, with the website. I don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. I don't know why things are moving so slowly. Maybe they're being held up by HR, you know, maybe maybe there's some, you know, public relations things that make it difficult for them to move quickly, but fortunately we are not beholden to to, the, to those things, so I'm, I'm hoping that we will definitely have administrators who are supportive of what we're doing. How does this connect with the broader community? So I think even, it, so for me, I come from out of state, I come from Colorado, and it was drawing for me to come here and see that like the service workers are predominantly people of color and just the disparities in employment and whatnot, um, so I think really getting a conversation going um, and like 
having students step out of that community bubble and seeing that like there are different concerns in this community, different people's experiences, different perceptions, um, and getting people to explore that. I'm, I'm not really sure how the website can help add to that, but hopefully we can figure out a way. I mean, I think challenging people's most basic assumptions about race that oftentimes we don't even realize that we have is something that's really important because, you know, it's, it's pretty stark. We've got a white black divide between the river campus and the 19th ward. So as students are inevitably spending more and more time in the ward, more people are living here, it's important for people to be checking their own racial biases and understanding, you know, uh, things about gentrification, um, you know, the, the kinds of racial issues that they're going to run into. And, and if uh, students are more educated, then, you know, that, that'll be better for everybody. I just really want to commend everyone um, that has fought the good fight and like has worked to make this university a better place, especially students that have taken up um, the difficulties of having to protest, having to have threats targeted at them and combating that, trying to get an education and um, trying to just make things better for everybody. I want to commend people.